Hello everyone from the, wherever you may be, um, welcome to the JSC UK virtual conference uh, 2020. This is session 1am on the agenda. Uh, some of you may know me already, um, but for those of you who don't, my name is Dave Austin and I'm Senior Technical Consultant with BMC Mainframe Services, uh, formerly RSM Partners, um, primarily working on ZVM and Linux, uh, on Z, amongst other things. Um, if you have any questions, can you place them through the chat and uh, I'll interrupt Adrian with the, the question as and, as and when is suitable. Um, I'll now hand over to your presenter, Adrian, Adrian Keward of Red Hat, who will take you through the, an overview of OpenShift. Over to you, Adrian. Great. Well, thanks for the intro, Dave. Uh, what I'll now do is I'll see if I'll, my screen will share. Let's just see if we've got PowerPoint. So if you can see uh, the screen, David, you can let me know. Yeah, that's okay. That's great. Okay, right, I'll go to full screen mode and then I'll get started. Okay, great. So uh, thank you everyone for, for joining. Uh, what I'm gonna try and do, um, I'll hopefully undershoot the time so uh, there's, there's plenty of time for questions towards the end. I'm going to go through a, 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 an overview of what OpenShift is um, to begin with what it is across all the platforms and then delve into the actual S390X or System Z platform as I go through. Um, so that aside, I should move on. So what is OpenShift? So very simply, OpenShift is an enterprise uh, platform to bring together a lot of elements that are required really for developing um, new applications, new style of applications, but also doing it within a construct which is actually easier to support than previously we would have approached sort of systems. So everything from self-service, multi-language, et cetera, et cetera, all is brought together in an easy to use system. Uh, I'll go through the, the components in a, in a second, but the whole idea is that it's easy for a developer to actually get started. Um, literally, as a terms of the speed to, um, what, what would be the best term, um, you know, the speed to hello world is, is really in terms of bringing that into sort of the full uh, factor or full view. So OpenShift effectively from an application components point of view sort of starts on the operating system level. So we run it on top of either Red Hat Op uh, Enterprise Linux or RHEL for short. Um, we have a lot of acronyms, so I'll try and avoid as many as possible. Uh, if you see them, I'll, I'll go through them. Or it sits on top of Core OS. And I'll talk about Core OS in a little more detail later on. But the idea is, as I mentioned, is really to have something from as simple as a container as a service all the way to function as a service or platform as a service. OpenShift basically covers all of them. Sitting on top of the operating system itself is Kubernetes that allows us to basically manage it. If you're not aware of Kubernetes, it comes from the Greek, the helmsman, and it basically is a, a way to manage components. Um, it's now effectively almost like the de facto standard to actually manage componentry as we move on. Sitting on top of that effectively is what OpenShift does, which is basically bringing in automated operations. And then we sit on top of cluster services, application services, and developer services. Cutting through all of that, it just means that basically it's a way that we can actually manage systems. We can basically bring code in. It allows uh, uh, automated builds to basically be very easy to do so that they work the same way all the way through. Whatever paradigm you want to use in terms of service meshes and serviceless, et cetera, is all catered for within an easy to use system. So from an architectural point of view, I'll start getting into a little bit more detail. So from a developer's point of view, what they want to do is basically get to those pipelines as quickly and as easy as possible. They don't want to spend their time asking for things. They just basically want to consume, almost like a catalog approach. So a developer would approach it either from, for example, a CI CD platform or in terms of something like Git to basically hold and use their code. But also the important part as we move on is the actual operations experience should be as easy. So less people required to actually bring the platform in. So what you see here is effectively the sort of the two major components within OpenShift as it deploys out. Left hand side, you'll see the masters and we have a number of masters to basically control and manage the service itself. There is always a sort of a multiple of three in terms of like voting rights to make sure the system continues. And then we have the various worker nodes with all the various components that they require, everything from monitoring, routing, et cetera, to bring it all together. And those sit in terms of compute and network and storage. 
Now, this is a real eye chart, this slide. And the idea is not for you to basically try and read it. Obviously, the slides will be available afterwards if you do want to delve in. But in terms of this is what we try and talk about in terms of containers. So the whole basis of this is to basically make containers easy to use. So this basically slide comes from the, uh, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation or CNCF. And if you look through this, you'll see various components, just about every company you can think of, everyone from the cloud providers down to hardware vendors are trying to make use of Kubernetes as a component and containers to basically bring that all together. So if you want to basically work out how to do your development, how to basically bring in your security compliance, to bring all of those elements together within registers, et cetera, this basically means you can just, anything you take here should all work together, which takes away a lot of the heartache and pain of basically integration. So what we do is we talk about building and deploying container images. So whether you're working from an application you're pulling down, or you're actually building something, we basically, we need to bring these items together. So you need a, what we refer to as an image repository. So this is where you basically bring your uh, components together as a container. I'll cover the, how these components actually work as we move through, but we, we basically need a method to do so. We then also need to basically find a way to basically build, to run the work as it move on. On the right hand side is a graphical representation. So this actually comes from the console in terms of what you actually see. So that the central blue ring is the I'm actually running. And then you will see the various components in terms of the build, the code and the run. That actually means it's very easy for both the operator to see what's running, but also the developer to basically start and stop and do what they want to do while developing their code. So a lot of it comes down to this, how do we make these things as automated as possible? So if, if we look at this in terms of the developer's point of view, they'll have their code in a repository of some kind. And what they want to do is basically go through the pipeline, say something like Jenkins, and actually start to build the image and start deploying it. So they'll put together their system, their components, their application, they put it into the registry, and it then basically feeds into OpenShift in terms of development. The beauty of the system then comes when you decide that that's now moving from a development view to a test view to UAT and production. This can all be automated. So again, the operator requirement becomes less and less because the developer is really in charge of all of the processes as they move through. And as you see from the very top, in terms of how do you basically decide what goes into production, all of those can be part of the process systems that you're already using, be that BMC or be it uh, ServiceNow, et cetera. So actual person in the loop or systems in the loop allows the, 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 the build, the development to be highly automated, but also make sure that effectively you're moving at a really rapid pace, really bringing in what basically the whole thing around uh, DevOps ends up being. So I'll go through some of the core concepts. So a container is the smallest sort of item of compute. So when we talk about various components, various items, the container is the smallest item. If you're not used to using containers at the moment, containers effectively, they don't actually contain. They don't sort of stop things on their own from running. They're a way of actually bringing together elements in the smallest possible view. If you're used to virtualization, then a container is very different in terms of size where a, a virtual machine on distributed compute platforms might be between six and 20 gigabytes. A container might be as small as 20 to 30 megabytes. And there's a lot of componentry and there's a lot of features that basically make the container useful from a developer's point of view in terms of actually how they move it forward. So it's the smallest item of compute we have. So containers are used to create Oh, sorry, containers are created from these particular images. So you've gone through, you've built your, your item, and you then basically put a container and it starts running. You still have control in terms of what's in it, in terms of life cycling, et cetera, but that can take a lot of time. You can do all the things I'm gonna talk about in OpenShift, basically almost like a DIY approach, but OpenShift takes away a lot of that time and effort and extra people to bring it all together. So I have my binary, I put it into container and now I'm running it. And I'm running it within the rules I'm gonna set in terms of the platform as I move on. So that's all well and good. I've got my image. Well, actually 
you'll tend to find in most organizations, there could be thousands and thousands of images. And you need a, a way to basically make sure that they're easy to access, that they're controlled, they're managed, they're governed in all the terms of what I'm actually going to run. So that's what we really refer to as a sort of an image uh, registry or repository where it's somewhere I'm storing. Now, you could basically use the sort of external repositories, uh, like some like Docker, or basically insert it in terms of an internal one, where you're actually controlling and managing what's actually going to be used. So people can't just basically pull down whatever they feel like, you're actually managing what in terms of the componentry throughout the stack. So image repository contains all the versions of an image. So as you see from the sort of left-hand side there, my front-end application, I've started off on 1.0 and through my cycling, I've basically gone through 1.1.2.0 or the latest. But I also got, for example, my Mongo version as well. So I can basically take these items and I can build my application based on these sort of set of containers. And I can choose because these are effectively layered and they're versioned. You know, I have a particular application that must use for example, front end 1.1 and Mongo 3.7, then effectively I can do so. And, but I can also control the life cycle as I move on. So I can make sure that dependencies, et cetera, are controlled and managed within my application. So the registry holds all of these different versions for whatever I need to use. So we now have our container and we now, now have to figure out how to, to run it. So the smallest level of control is a pod. So a pod can be a single container or a pod can be multiple containers. Uh, so those multiple containers could be the whole of my application. It could be my front end app. It could be my database. It could be whatever code components I want to put in it. Or my pod effectively could just be multiple copies of that first front end because I'm looking in terms of maximum uptime or maximum reliability or maximum access. But from a simplistic point of view, let's say that effectively I'm going to be separating it out in terms of my particular application. I'm going to have running in sort of separate pods. And as you see from underneath it, there you see the particular IP addresses. So it's something that I can basically, I can manage and access. Because in the end, I'm going to be talking about services. So one of the things that OpenShift will do and one of the things we, we, we try to sort of look at from the very earliest times is in terms of how you replicate. So you basically, you're setting up the rules to make sure the number of pods are running at one particular time. So if you have a front end application that you're basically saying, um, I'm, I want a minimum of two or three running at all times, something happens to one of those containers, then the system would automatically start another one or you get to a position where load is becoming quite a problem, the system can automatically start more containers, or sorry, more pods with those containers as required. And when that particular event becomes to an end, like for example, uh, uh, if there's an internet shopping, then you need, there is less requirement, then the system will automatically shut down the pods above, which it doesn't need. So it can be very efficient and look at in terms of you know, multi-tenancy or multi-usage to basically bring down and make sure that just the right systems are running at the levels of the service you're actually trying to, prevent, uh, to provide. So as part of that, you're basically, you're setting the rules around replicas, labels, CPU usage, memory, et cetera. You're setting those rules to make sure that particular applications are running at a certain level. So you've decided and you're, you're building your application and it's version one and you're, you're rapidly moving towards the next version. You can decide in terms of what happens next about when to basically update the service that's running. You know, are you gonna do it immediately? Are you gonna wait for a service interval? Or are you gonna wait until this particular container stops and then it'll automatically replace with another one? You, know, you might want to do that if you're basically doing, another, again, a shopping cart you're going to wait for everyone to have finished and when they've all finished their particular purchasing then you're going to agree to the next version and that can all be done seamlessly or automatically because effectively the versioning allows you to do so and something goes wrong you can basically move back to previous versions very easily so mentioned this sort of in passing but uh, effectively what we're really now talking about is we've got containers we've got pods and with those particular elements that sit inside them, we now want to talk about services because effectively we're now talking about 
items that are brought together to basically build a solution or a service. And to do so, basically, I'm building a, effectively a backend, which brings all those items together. And it now looks at load balancing them. So I've got one container might be getting a little overloaded, or you might have decided that a particular host you have maybe having more processing power or more, more compute than another. And you're going to basically want to make sure that you're using that capability. So you can basically move those around to make use of it. So we now start talking about a service discovery. So effectively, I can now address that service when I basically want to make sure that the particular service is running. So I need to make sure that this has got three, three pods running at any one time. I might need more, but I'm basically making sure I have a minimum set and the system will keep those maintained. Once you have that service, Instead of actually talking to a particular uh, IP address on the back end, I can now talk to a particular service to basically say, I'm going to manage my components as I move through. So I, I now talk about, you know, I now have my front end app one, and I'm going to talk to app one throughout my, the rest of my system. And I can make, make sure that I'm now devolved from a particular, do I need to care about the particular internal IP addressing? I don't. I'm basically saying my database talks to my front end app talks to my application code or my external database, and that's all done transparently. And then we want to start exposing this to the outside world. So uh, the left-hand side here, if you're not used to uh, sort of Unix or Linux commands, curl is like a, a, a command line browser. So I can basically point it at a particular URL. So what we've done here is we've exposed a root. And when that root's exposed for my sort of front-end service, uh, that service discovery can now sort of move to one side and I can now talk to the application directly. So whatever happens to those particular containers sitting behind them, those particular pods, if I lose one, it doesn't matter, my service will keep going. And because of the automatic load balancing, so I don't have to write load balancing code, then that system will keep going and it will basically move between those pods depending on whatever rules I've set, but making sure that nothing is overloaded and I can basically just concentrate on my application itself. Now, a lot of applications, and I've, I've seen this over many years on very large systems, is the one thing to be uh, the application to be up as another to actually know whether it's actually ready for use. So one of the things that OpenShift does sort of automatically is basically making sure that that particular container, those pods are actually alive. And if they're not, what you do about it in terms of uh, killing it or restarting, or is it ready? Is it something that's actually just sitting waiting for use or it's not? So within these sort of controls and sets, you can make sure that the whole system is, is running and it's capable without necessarily taking sort of a big view in terms of uh, monitoring or performance. You're actually getting this from the very lowest level you're still getting the performance and monitoring that you wish to use to make sure it's hitting those but you're making sure that the particular elements themselves are actually as, as self-aware as they can be so once we start moving through when we start adding more and more components to this we can start thinking about well i have pods for example this in this example for a payment for another one for catalog another for payment uh, for a a production system and imagery. So I can basically make sure that I can isolate these particular uh, pods, catalogs, etc., from particular groups and departments. So you only see what you basically are allowed to see. So it has full RBAC capabilities. So you're making sure that the application is going to run exactly, or you're actually making sure that only the right people can run and access particular ca uh, catalogs. So you, you can think about more security, you can think about making sure just those right systems are, are in the right places at the right time. So that was a very quick sort of step through the actual components in terms of what sits behind or what actually makes the container up and, and the pods themselves. So I then move into sort of operations and infrastructure. So OpenShift, uh, its full title is OpenShift Container Platform, or OCP. Uh, you'll see that in a number of the slides, so that's just in case you worry about the acronyms. We have a number of methods to basically place it on systems. We have a sort of a fully automated stack, which I'll talk about uh, as we go through. Um, if you wish to use, uh, effectively, instead of the core OS, which I'll, I'll cover in a second anyway, and you actually want to use uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux you already have deployed, you can do so in terms of just changing some of the componentry and, and some of the actual DNS, et cetera. 
There is also a version just uh, for completeness, which is available on, hosted on some of the cloud providers. Uh, I won't go into that in detail, but effectively that's Red Hat running uh, OpenShift as a service on top of those vendors. So I've mentioned CoreOS and it is an important part of OpenShift. Um, as mentioned, RHEL can be used or Red Hat Enterprise Linux can be used as sort of a general purpose um, container platform that OpenShift can sit on top. The beauty of the other approach, which is CoreOS, is effectively it's an immutable container host. So immutable effectively means that you can't change it. If you try and change it outside of OpenShift, because OpenShift actually manages it, then effectively it will be isolated and the, the actual host itself will be restarted. So yes, you can log into it. Yes, you can look, but if you try and install anything on it or try and change it, then effectively the system says this is invalid. So it gives you another layer of security in terms of making sure it just does what's required. It's also very, very thin. CoreOS is just enough operating system to run containers and nothing else. So if you want to run other things on top of the nodes, uh, the, the workers, then if effectively you'd be using RHEL. But in this instance, what we're saying is OpenShift becomes more of a turnkey solution. It basically is optimized and designed just to run containers. So I mentioned this, so the immutable operating system it really means that the actual platform itself manages the actual uh, operating components that sit below it. So effectively development, managing, owning, controlling, supporting the actual platform itself. OpenShift supports and basically runs through uh, all the components itself. You'll see on the left-hand side here, I'll talk about Cryo in a second. Kubelet's basically uh, part of the Kubernetes configuration, configurations, et cetera, and, and actual SSH configuration. So these are just basically some of the technical components in terms of use to actually run it. Uh, an operator, uh, which I'm not certain if I actually go into any detail later on, but very quickly, an operator is a method to bring a new application onto the OpenShift platform without you necessarily having to understand how to optimize it, uh, libraries it might require, so effectively, it's like it's like a maybe like an Argos catalog or shop catalog of some kind. That basically says, "I want that application." You click on it, and it then brings it into the system and then installs itself as part of OpenShift. So, operators is a way to make it even simpler to actually take applications forward. The beauty of OpenShift and CoreOS together, it means that you don't now need to worry about patching the CoreOS operating system because OpenShift will do that. You need less people to manage the environment. Once you've set it up and it starts running, then you basically decide when it's going to patch and how it's going to be patched. But effectively, it takes away a great deal of the problem in terms of how you manage the platform itself. So uh, you have probably have heard of uh, Docker. Um, and uh, effectively, what we're talking about here does the same thing as the original Docker API. Um, in terms of actually how the actual engine itself runs. Now we're using Cryo. Now Cryo is a newer um, program. Uh, this particular program is designed to do exactly what Docker does, but lighter and faster. And we match it against the Kubernetes version. So if we look at, for example, uh, say OpenShift 4.5, that uses Kubernetes 1.18 or 118. And with the, the, the version that matches is Cryo 118. We do this because Kubernetes changes very rapidly. You know, three or four changes a year is what we would expect. It could be as much as six or 10 or whatever. But we want to make sure that OpenShift brings those latest features and functions as soon as we can test and make them available inside of OpenShift. So we're looking at a long-term supportability, but also ease of use. So that you know, you're not having to worry about, well, how do I consume this? And it's only changed a few months ago to I need to make this platform sustainable for three, four years, et cetera, as you move on. And that's what OpenShift can do for you. So no presentation will be correct in terms of OpenShift without talking about security. And a lot of this really becomes to an idea of extending the security ecosystem. So this is the same across all of the platforms it runs on in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the application control. It's all making sure the right people have access, the APIs are controlled, whether you want to have containerized uh, network isolation or you basically want to make this available so everything is accessible from the outside. 
you're making those decisions and the system is going to basically based on it. Now, I mentioned early on that basically containers don't actually contain. Well, when you use the actual control features that are part of OpenShift, when we think about the lowest possible level, we talk about C groups, we talk about SE Linux, then we are actually saying we can make sure that a container doesn't go outside its own boundaries, that it can't infect or, or basically change any other container unless you're allowed it to do so. It does give you a level of security, which you don't get by just containers on their own or doing a DIY Kubernetes approach. It, makes, it allows you to make it a system which is certifiable at whatever level of security you wish to go to. So I've talked about general terms. I've talked about OpenShift running on effectively all of the platforms we make available. And now I'm gonna go into specifics around running OpenShift on the S390X or IBM Z, depending on uh, whichever terms you use. So what are we talking about here? Well. Everything is the same so far. Uh, and from a normal developer's point of view, they wouldn't know what version of the platform they're actually running on because they don't need to know. But from an operational point of view or a systems management point of view, there are differences between the platforms and it's really a case of how we make the best use of those. So what I've done here is I basically listed when we're looking at either on the Z or Linux one in terms of how it differs in terms of almost like the distributed. So if you're used to the x86 world or power, then what differences is actually running on top of Z make? Is there a good reason to do so? So what I try to do here is actually list in terms of what actually differs between the platforms. And it's really how the platforms can, can actually provide additional capabilities beyond what OpenShift does itself, all using those capabilities. So we're always used in terms of faster innovation, time to value, et cetera. So yeah, the normal sort of marketing message you'd expect in terms of the platform. It provides a simpler set of APIs so the developers and admins can get started. Um, safer deployments, life cycling, et cetera. But we'll come more of this be more evident when you see some of the diagrams I've included in a couple of slides. Pre-validated patterns, again, very useful to make sure that effectively your solution is basically future orientated, et cetera, et cetera. What we're talking about here is making sure that we can make sure that the whole of the platform is future proof and that whatever technology you want to use, it allows you to make a decision based on some very simple ideas. You know, where is, if I'm using multi architectures across my environment, where is the best place to run this application? Do I want to take advantage of IBM Z or do I basically want to put effectively almost like a web system and I don't need the power and the, the closeness of the system as I move on. So what we've been doing is we've worked with IBM since the uh, uh, basically version, we brought out version four of OpenShift to basically bring out more of these capabilities that the, the system can provide. So obviously as part of the, uh, the footprints concerned, you want non-disruptive growth horizontal scalability is something and vertical scalability, we can basically come accumulate. Obviously, if you're gonna look for the, the maximum number of containers or pods you can run on a particular system, then one platform is basically unbe almost unbeatable when you look at the capabilities, obviously the Z15. I've included, uh, when you look at the slides afterwards, the link to the, uh, the Z15 in terms of the number of containers run. Containerizing workloads, well, we think this is actually the place where everyone will be. Uh, we don't believe that monolithic applications are the way that people will want to build or even uh, buy services to build systems that can be broken down into smaller components, allows you to basically change systems at different rates. You know, I don't need to basically be so tied to a particular version of, so of something. I can do it basically based on my applications requirements or my business requirements. The one thing that certainly the, the platform has above all else is of course more access to more of the security. So I've listed here in terms of crypto capabilities in terms of obviously IBM Z, but also FIPS 140-2 level four certification. This is on top of the, uh, the FISMA we're working on in terms of the standard platform and also ISO 27001-2013. So this is additional on top of those capabilities. Obviously as one of the things that we do get uh, a lot of questions around is in terms of uh, ALPARAS isolation. So obviously the best you can do on distributed is AL4. 
but obviously you can get EER5 plus um, on the mainframe itself, or systems there, whatever you, terminal you wish to use. So more isolation, more cap capabilities, and more obviously in terms of uh, air gapping. You also have more resource controls through RACF, ZVM, et cetera. So long and short of this is, if you have a capability you're using elsewhere on the mainframe, you have access to it on OpenShift. You can decide what runs on it and where was the best platform to run the particular application that your developers are building. So what does that do in terms of actually how we bring these elements together? The beauty of the, uh, the system Z in terms of this whole approach is of course, if you have everything close together, then obviously greater speed, greater security. And you look at cloud native applications, the one thing that early generations did is they missed that capability of linking those together to basically make things as fast as possible. So I'm gonna skip over that. I think those are pretty much there, latency advantages, et cetera. What we're trying to do here, and the Z platform allows us to do this in a, in a sort of a greater extent, is build more and more secure cloud solutions. Um, digitization, sorry, digitization and modernization is something that we, we really are driving. Um, Microsoft containers, I think we'll skip over those. It's just a few mess, marketing messages to put that. I'll go into the diagrams, I think, in a second. Uh, yeah, okay. So don't think there's much more there. Apart from mentioning, of course, everything we talked about in terms of OpenShift is automation. If you want to automate further out to basically bring other applications in, everything from firewalls, routers, et cetera, and then of course we have Ansible and also the in terms of IBM's cloud brokers as well. So Ansible effectively allows you to automate the whole thing. It allows you to automate pipelines, it allows you to automate patching, it allows you to automate whatever you need to do. And obviously as part of that, the whole environment, Ansible become basically a part of a tool set, which is not just for operations, but also for development. And we find that in terms of almost like a 50-50 split in terms of sort of requirements in terms of we need it to be development, we need to operations. It's one tool that can basically really save time, money and effort. So uh, consolidation, TCO reduction. I think a lot of this really comes down to the advantages of IBM Z. Fewer physical resources, smaller footprints, operational endpoints to manage, less security, et cetera. You're working with the environment that you understand and you're working with an environment effectively you may be additional capability you already have. And there's no reason, of course, in terms of disaster recovery and capacity backup, in terms of licensing, et cetera. Uh, or from our point of view, it's subscriptions, but yes. Okay, so uh, business continuity and HR and DR. Okay, I don't think there's much else to mention here. A lot of these are basically just to go through if you wish to later, but in terms of it works obviously with Z uh, VM hypervisor. So if you want to take advantage of the system, you want to take advantage of uh, DASD, et cetera. Um, okay, expanded disaster recovery, hardware consolidation, capacity, yeah, okay, right. So what I'm trying to do in these couple of diagrams is just really, as I come towards the end of the presentation, uh, is talk to and actually try and visualize what this looks like. So from a IBM Z or a Linux One, in terms of the particular LPARs you're running on, and then we see obviously the hypervisor and then core OS and then the OpenShift clusters running on top. These are very highly linked together. Obviously as many LPARs as you have, whatever systems you're already running, but obviously from this, you see from a topology point of view, you know, your data warehouse, you can't get any closer to those particular clusters as you want to move on, be those production or development. So whatever capabilities, whatever features, functions you're using in terms of the system already, you would have access to those on a shorter uh, track as you can. So virtual machines in a cluster. So we talked, we've just seen there almost like two LPARs, which can talk together against the, uh, the data warehouse. But obviously, as far as this is concerned, you could have a whole cluster inside a particular uh, LPAR sitting on top of hypervisor. Um, the control plane, as I mentioned, or I mentioned already, that we basically need almost like three controls, and those allow us to basically do whatever's required. And then you basically have as many compute nodes as you need. Uh, the compute is actually what you buy or have the subscription for, and that's really basically doing the actual work. The controls are basically all the control planes there to allow us to manage and build the system. But obviously from 
as you see from this sort of diagram, whatever you've got sort of from the networking point of view or the storage point of view, you have access to, but I've got a very simple, so I can have a single cluster running inside that one LPAR. It's just down to the capability or capacity of that LPAR. So if I want to think about clustering, then I can use the normal rules you'd apply in depending whatever application you'd be running. And I can basically split my cluster between various LPARs, sitting in the hypervisors, I'd have a control plane, so a control module in each one of those uh, particular um, LPARs, and then all my compute nodes sort of running along. So if I was to lose an LPAR, I'm not going to lose much because the rest of the system will then basically uh, restart particular compute nodes as if nothing had happened. The key part of a lot of the, when we talk about containers and those pods is I don't care actually about a particular container. I don't care about a particular pod because I'm basically, if something goes wrong, I'm going to start a new one. Um, it's a bit like the IDC analogy of pets versus cattle. A pet is something I'm going to keep maintained. I'm going to, in the compute world, I'm going to patch it. I'm going to almost love it. Whereas in a, if I'm a farmer, I have cattle. I don't really care about individual cows. I care about basically what I'm producing at the end. And containers are that same approach because I don't want to care about a particular item. I, I want to basically have my service. And if something goes wrong or something stops working, I stop it, kill it, and basically start a new one. And this allows you to think about in terms of cluster point, uh, support is because I've moved all of the things that are important out. So I'm doing my compute inside those particular nodes, but anything that I do need to keep my stateful data is actually in a shared file system. So I don't care. It allows me to change version numbers because I don't care. It allows me to do what I need to as a developer and as an operator because I don't care. I can do all of this within a simple confines of a console that allows me to say, the service is what I care about. So when you move outside the actual LPARs themselves running the particular clusters, so multiple clusters, I can then have either a load balancing, which is built into the particular clusters, or I can then start using the network services outside. So external DNS, DHCP, NFS, et cetera, whatever services I want to use, I have full access to, and I can basically bring those in because I'm exposing, as I mentioned already, those ideas of a root. So when the service is there, then I can basically, I can separate components, separate out functions. Everything is basically on a smaller and smaller componentry level. So I, I can basically manage and build those services out. I can change those components when I need to, or new versions required, new versions become available because we're trying to be more agile in the approach. And I think almost as I'm coming to the last of my actual slides, this is just an example of the LPAR isolation for EEL5+. You know, it's really just saying that whatever you're trying to do in terms of system Z, if you want to have that ultimate uh, security, ultimate air gapping, then there is no better platform to deploy on. But obviously, if you want distributed, then you can do the same thing. But OpenShift remains the same, no matter which platform you put it onto. It really just allows you to make those decisions for the application, the service you're actually building. Now, I think this is actually my last one as I go through. But this is just basically a screen capture of the container images of our website, which is filtered for the S390 architecture and for Red Hat. And this just shows you that as far as OpenShift is concerned, running on uh, S390X, IBM Z, Linux One, that there's a lot of those componentries, a lot of those containers, a lot of those things we're talking about that will go into your registry are actually available. So it's not a second class citizen. In fact, it's a first class citizen allowing you to make those decisions. And then of course, is there anything in terms of out of these base items, those application blocks, those application or those build tools, et cetera, you still can build whatever you want to on top of them but a lot of the heartache, the pain, the trouble is already been done for you. And you're basically consuming. And you're consuming because somebody else has spent the time to make sure it's enterprise ready, everything's working, and they're basically supported through its, at, at its life cycle. And that concludes it. Uh, just about right, I think, in terms of time. Uh, if there's any questions, more than happy to answer any. Uh, Adrian, have you got your um, QR code there? Yes. Okay. Um, if everyone could um, fill in the uh, conference feedback, uh, thank you for attending. 
and uh, thank you, Adrian, for a, an interesting presentation. Oh, we have a question. Um, if someone running these technologies on a cloud, is anything being done to offer running the environment on Z from IBM's cloud? Um, so we're working with IBM in terms of how they're going to make it available. For people using IBM Cloud, it is available already. Um, so OpenShift is, is available through IBM Cloud. Um, we're working with uh, them on terms of whether it's going to be a dedicated offering as well. So Red Hat runs it for them. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, any more questions from anyone? Okay, I think um, I think that's it. I'll um, I'll close the meeting now. Uh, thank you all for attending. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, David.